Yeah, great. Okay. So, thank you very much for having me, Piero. It's really a treat to be here. It's especially a treat to be speaking to an audience in a scientific setting. Uh, you know, mostly I spoke, speak with, with uh, other cultural historians like myself, uh, many of whom are anxious about technology for various reasons. Um, I'm a cultural historian. I study American culture and American media after World War II. Um, and the story of American media after World War II is the story of the integration of scientific culture with mainstream popular American culture. So that's really what I do. I'm going to take you back today to the book that, that Piero mentioned, uh, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, and give you a sense of the core argument there. I think it's an argument that's pretty timely, or one piece of it's pretty timely. I think we live in an era in which, as, as the previous speaker suggested, we face a new set of political conversations and decisions. Yet, I think that we have inherited from the 60s a habit of mm, dodging politics particularly in the tech sector, particularly in the social media world. Anybody here from Facebook? Excellent. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to give a, a tight talk, three parts. First, I'm just going to go back to the question of what the counterculture was. Then I'm going to argue that um, technology had more to do with politics in 1968 than we tend to think it does. And finally, I'm going to pull back and ask what the counterculture does to shape contemporary Silicon Valley. Um, as Piero said, I, I do do quite a bit up with psychedelic culture. It's a dirty job that somebody's got to do it. Um, so what was the counterculture? All right, brief bit of history. Um, the book I wrote before this was a book about how Americans remember the Vietnam War. When I studied the Vietnam War, I studied a time in which computers were the emblem of the Cold War military industrial state. I was astonished when I went back to graduate school after being a journalist for a long time and saw Wired Magazine and its psychedelic covers and people I knew from the 60s promoting computers as agents of cultural change. And so I started to dig into that and I went back to the counterculture and I started rummaging around. Um, here you'll see a picture of the free speech movement in 1964. These are marchers at Berkeley. To give you a sense of how negatively computers were viewed at the time, you can see that they are carrying Hollerith cards that have been stamped out with the word strike or FSN. Some of you may be old enough to remember the phrase from anti-Vietnam War protests, I'm a human being, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate. That's the language that was printed on the Hollow Earth card. Uh, the, the free speech movement is a fascinating case. One of the triggers for it was the computerization of student records. Now think about that for a sec. Uh, <laughs> you know, would that make people march today? <laughs> but, but what was driving the marches back then was the sense and the fear that these students had that by turning the registration process into something digital, they would be dehumanized. Their bodies would be taken out of the equation. So I inherited a story as a historian about the counterculture that turns out to have been wrong. Uh, when I started working on this project, most of the historians who I was reading, historians of the 60s, were people who had written their books in the 80s and were themselves children of the 60s. And they told a kind of heroic story <coughs> about a generation that had marched against the Vietnam War during the day, gone home, gotten high, gotten up and done it again. It's kind of a, a, a story of people who um, were, were both countercultural and political. It turns out that that isn't quite right. Um, in my work, I discovered that there were at least two countercultures. One um, focused on doing politics to change politics. We can think of that as the new left. Focused on struggle very much invested in having leaders, parties, political actions, centered much more in Berkeley than in San Francisco or even down here at Stanford, uh, probably associated most visibly with Students for a Democratic Society, um, headed for a while by Todd Gitlin. The other group with whom I became fascinated, we can think of as new communalists. These are folks who, in fact, eschewed politics. So, give you an example. 1966, Ken Kesey, Larry Prankster, was invited to speak at an anti-Vietnam War rally in Oakland. Everybody was getting excited. They were going to march. They were going to march down and stop the induction of young men. And Kesey got up and said, don't march. That's what they do. What you should do is go home and change the world. And he took out his harmonica and he played home, home on the range. For the new communalists, what would change the world was a transformation in consciousness. Now, they were against big technologies, they were against military technologies as such, they were against weapons, but they were very much in favor of small-scale technologies that could transform the mind. 
most particularly LSD, but not only LSD. Also, things like um, stereo amplifiers, giant speakers. Um, you know, some of you are, are too young to remember a time before there were actually giant amplified concerts available. I'm not. I remember the first time I went to a not a Grateful Dead concert, and I got up close to the speaker, and my whole body vibrated. That was an incredible experience. Folks in the Beatles movement very much treasured that experience. Between 1966 and 1973, they actually had the largest wave of commune building in all of American history. Depending on who you talk to, as many as a million Americans headed back to the land for the purpose of building alternative communities, communities centered not around politics, not around governance or law, but around shared mindset, consciousness. All right, both of these groups were anti-bureaucracy, anti-big tech, and anti-mass culture, but they were in fact quite different. It's the communalists who have shaped our time through computation. They were very much centered in San Francisco and here around Stanford. Um, some of you may know that the Mary Pranksters used to hang out back on Perry Lane by the golf course. Stuart Brand, who I've written about extensively, we'll talk about in a moment, um, was a Stanford grad, Stanford alum. Stanford Engineering Department used to draw fast together and have tea groups. Anybody here from the Stanford Engineering Department know Willis Terman? Oh, not Willis Terman, Willis Harmon? Willis Harmon? Okay. Um, phew. I'm always afraid I'm going to talk about that at Stanford, so I'll have been there. Um, in any case, communes. This is one of the first and most influential, Drop City, 1965, uh, set out in the plains of Trinidad, Colorado. And it's kind of fascinating to me, right? Folks head out, they call themselves droppers, they're going to drop out of society. They live in the middle of a Colorado that they describe as empty of people. It's not, it's filled with Native Americans and Mexican Americans. Okay? Um, they're mostly white, they're mostly upper and upper middle class. What do they do? They, they build these domes that look just like spaceships. Now, I was always told that the counterculture was a rebellion against mainstream, technocentric, technocratic America. Look at those domes. That's not a rebellion, that's an imitation. How were they made? Well, each of those little squares used to be the top of an automobile. The folks who did Drop City believed that what one needed to do was to take the resources of industrial society and recombine them and transform them into tools for consciousness transformation. Um, some of you may remember that uh, it, it used to be an insult to call someone a square. Well, for, okay, I gotta help the folks who are under 40 here. Um, <laughs> to be called a square was to be accused of being too rigid, too linear, too rational. That kind of housing, that kind of dome, was designed to physically prevent your becoming a square. I mean, dead seriously. You know, in that kind of environment, you were in touch with the forces of the universe. All right, so where did these people come from? Okay, the myth that I had always heard was that the children of the 60s were rebels against the whole world of the 40s and 50s. That the 40s and 50s were a locked down, closed off, psychologically constrained and contained period. In some ways that's true, they did bring us McCarthy, but the 40s and 50s were actually much more open than anyone remembers, and that was the subject of, of my book, The Democratic Surround. The important thing to remember about the children of the 60s is this. They grew up in the era of the greatest abundance in American history. In the wake of World War II, America's economic engines were firing on every cylinder. We had just completed the nationwide highway system. Uh, some of you have probably taken road trips. Road trips as such were sort of hard to do before we got a highway system. Ken Kesey's driving around in the Volkswagen bus was something that was possible after that period. This group grew up in a funny, funny kind of technological conundrum. On the one hand, they were afraid of nuclear holocaust. They were afraid of large-scale weapons and the world that had brought them into being. On the other hand, they had the greatest concentration of consumer technologies ever rendered to Americans. Uh, in my own case, I'll never forget when I got a portable 45 RPM record player and was able to not have to listen to my parents' music anymore. I no longer had to have the records of the Matavani in the living room. I could take my record player and, and, and play what I thought were terribly dangerous records, you know, in my own room, right? I could play like rockabilly kind of stuff. But it was mine, it was my own. The challenge for this generation was, uh, with regard to technology, was how do we not become like the boxed up people who brought us the Vietnam War, but how do we also not let go of the consumer goods that we grew up with? Um, 
Fortunately, uh, there's a man named Buckminster Fuller there to show them the way. Um, Buckminster Fuller was an architect, a writer for Fortune magazine, um, the man who patented, though he did not in fact invent, the geodesic dome, which you see behind you there. And he was probably the man over 30 most trusted by uh, the generation of the 1960s. Here he is at Moscow in 1959 at the American National Exhibition. He had actually been very active in military research. He was also very active in American propaganda across the Cold War. And he uh, was famous for building the Geodesic Dome, which you can see there behind him. For the hippies, he had an idea that was incredibly important. And the idea was the idea of comprehensive design. He believed that each of us should be designers of our own lives. And that it was our mission to take the technologies of American industry and repurpose them and make them tools for the transformation of consciousness. And he had, a, he had his own peculiar language which, in which he expressed this idea. It was very popular on communists. If man is to continue as a successful pattern complex function, I don't know about you, but I don't really feel like a pattern complex function. I get it, but no. Uh, in universal evolution, it's because he, need, he will have witnessed the rise of the artist scientist. Now, this character, ladies and gentlemen, is the prototype of the hacker who we hear about today. The artist scientist is the creative but technically adept individual who designs his own life, takes the tools of the world and designs them to create a new interlinked world of shared consciousness adequate for all humanity. So this, this book, Ideas and Integrities, um, was very popular on the communes. The essay that I'm quoting here was actually written in about 1940, but it was very popular across the communes in the 1960s. Uh, the dome is a very good example of the kind of technology that we're talking about here. It was first a military technology, that's Buckminster Fuller, watching um, a dome be lowered by a, a, a marine helicopter for the defense early warning line, which is a radar line that stretched across uh, Northern America to Greenland. Um, but on domes, I mean, I'm sorry, communes, domes were something entirely different. This is the Lama Foundation in 1968. Um, the folks there are dancing for world peace under a geodesic dome. On the communes, the domes had been repurposed and transformed into technologies for the remaking of consciousness and the living of exemplary lives. So the thing about the communes is that they were a world without politics. They were a world in which party-based politics ruled out the window. They were also some of the most conservative, bigoted environments I've ever studied. They were worlds in which men ruled. Women adopted very traditional, conventional postures. They tended to, I, I can't tell you the number of pictures I've seen of barefoot pregnant women carrying bread. I'm not kidding, long hair, the whole thing. Um, they were predominantly white, and no one was, no one was bigoted, no one, no one was prejudiced, no one would say, I'm sorry, black folks aren't welcome here. But they would say things like, well, you know, black folks should kind of get their own common views. It's just, what they do is just not really, like, cool with what we do. Okay, if you're as creeped out by that as I am, well, it's a kind of sort of psychological red line. So, let's jump now to Burning Man. This is the Burning Man Festival out in the, out in the desert. I've been there three times to study it. This is Mark Zuckerberg's dome. <laughs> Just say. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, my point being, that this is a slightly different story, that today the legacy of the dream of building a technology-enabled collaborative world of like-minded people that animated the communists of the 1960s animates the drive for social media. People echo it very explicitly, and they are building inside firms structures that are founded first in the communal world. So here we'll go inside Facebook and just have a quick glimpse of this. Um, Facebook has a very robust art program. They're very concerned inside Facebook to develop the engineer as an artist scientist, someone who is extraordinarily creative, socially adept, and committed to connecting the world, as they said. Never mind, they are also building one of the most robust surveillance systems for profit ever created. Google, very similarly, creative scientists, creative artists, look at all that color, um, very self-consciously producing engineers who can imagine themselves as artists, scientists, valuing the technologies of industry in such a way as to change the world. Change the world in, by, implicitly in the way that the counterculture did, but actually, in fact, in a way that the counterculture might not be so happy with. This is where we live today. We inhabit a world in which 
people tell us that sharing is the new buy. That we have, thanks to new digital technologies, an ability to connect to one another, to build communities that are distributed in place and time, to share consciousness, and to escape the predations of traditional economics. Um, I think that's nonsense. I, I think this is a, 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 just a horribly sad legacy for a utopian moment um, that I'm otherwise fascinated by. Thank you.